glad you're here for the second of our series on legends and legacies of Vine Lake Cemetery. Um, I'm Rob Gregg, president of the Vine Lake Preservation Trust. And um, the best laid plans sometimes of mice and men never work out that way. But the idea was to have indoor walking tours during the winter when there was little to do. Um, but our first walking tour uh, back on February 14th was canceled or rescheduled because of the blizzard. And you'll notice that on the back of your um, program that it's now going to be on April 25th. Um, two weeks ago, we had another presentation called The Doctor is In on the causes of death in early medical berries. And um, that per presentation in the afternoon uh, ended up iffy because in the morning there was no heat in this building. Now today we have rain and the possibility of freezing rain this morning. So um, who knows what God has wrought relative to our plans. But at least you're indoors, you're sitting, it's warm, uh, and um, that's one of the benefits of having an indoor walking tours is that in the comfort here, you can see a lot more uh, imagery of people and the cemetery than you can if you were there. So there's some, some trade-offs uh, either way. Um, I thought we need a chair way over there. So famous, noteworthy, and ordinary. And that just about covers everybody that's buried over there. So um, it will be uh, your decision as to who fits what category. Um, but we're going to uh, take a look at a, a variety of persons who are there, and I'll give some background. And if there's, uh, if there's a comment or a question that you want to ask, uh, when we're dealing with that particular person, you're more than welcome to ask. <coughs> It's uh, very appropriate that we begin our tour today with uh, William Smith Childen, um, who's a very common, um, historical, uh, famous, and noteworthy person who is buried in the cemetery. Um, he uh, wrote The History of Medfield in 1888, uh, which today is uh, pretty much the vital for Medfield history as well as numerous genealogies of uh, early citizens at the back of the book. Uh, he was born here in Medfield to Eliezer Perry Tilden and Catherine Smith, and he married in 1853 Olive Mason Babcock. Uh, he was a very devout Baptist. And uh, that uh, connection to the First Baptist Church here in Medfield allowed him for 40 years to be the director of the music of that church. Um, certain things are said about him, and it always um, is remarkable that one of the things that he was a Republican in his politics. Um, <clears throat> he was a teacher of music in uh, the public schools of Salem, Newton, Pittsfield, and Framingham. So it's quite a journey he must have had to make in the uh, late 1800s, excuse me, uh, to get to those places. And uh, while uh, he lived here in Medfield, he was also the director of music at the State Normal School in Framingham. Um, 
His historical works, as I've already said, are the history of the myth field. Um, he was the featured speaker in 1901 when Midfield had its um, 250th anniversary. Um, that uh, presentation, the speech that he made, is uh, in print today. Um, he also did a fair number of reminiscences and sketches of old homesteads here in Midfield. Um, his literary work, as he branched out, uh, was that he wrote school music books. Um, and uh, he also wrote a uh, somewhat fanciful and recons uh, reconstructed account of life in early Medfield titled The Souvenir of Medfield. Mercy Scully was the daughter of Liberty. Uh, she flew under the radar until the last few years when uh, Sam Foreman, um, who wrote the quintessential um, history of uh, her fiance, Dr. Joseph Warren, uh, came to town and identified uh, Mercy and her grave. Um, she'd been here from 1826. No one knew much about her at all until Sam appeared on the screen. And um, uh, this is a very elaborate painting of her by uh, John Copley Sargent, um, the lady in blue. Um, given that appearance, she may uh, get the honor of being this elegant lady uh, buried in the cemetery. But that was a very early uh, photograph of her. Uh, her fiance uh, was General Joseph Warren. Now he had been married and he had four children at, at the time he was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1777. And so um, Mercy came on the scene at that point in time to um, um, care for those children. Um, she was uh, removed as they were from Boston. Uh, during the war, and lived in Worcester, and um, then <coughs> she eventually came to Methville. She labored long and hard um, with some of the key people in the revolution to get um, um, funding for the rearing of Joseph Warren's four children. And some of her letters um, to uh, John Hancock and uh, John Adams are um, available today for reading at the Cambridge Historical Society. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she did come to uh, Worcester. She worked uh, long and hard to uh, get their particular um, uh, things in order, but that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, eventually failed when one of Joseph Warren's uh, siblings decided that uh, he had um, more honor, either more honor or more legality to um, deal with them. And so she eventually repaired to um, Medfield and she lived in the Prentice House, uh, which still stands today up on North Street. Um, there's a little village of condominiums there on the right hand side, the other side of uh, Dale Street School. You may recognize that building there. But she came to Medfield because her sister, was married to the Reverend Thomas Prentice, who was indeed the minister in Medfield at that point in time. So, um, so she came here, and uh, this is a uh, image of her gravestone the cemetery that has been uh, uh, reset. When we first discovered uh, this stone. Um, you can see uh, a change in color of the stone slightly below the line of uh, January 8th, 1826. Uh, for some reason, the stone had been set that deep into the earth. And so the inscription was all um, covered up, as well as her age and the, the date. And um, another gentleman here today, uh, George 
Ray and I had the honor of resetting this stone. Um, this stone is a perfect example of what we inherit in the cemetery when about 40% of slate gravestones are below grade. And so this went down deep into the ground and it was heavy and at the bottom of it, it had these little shoulders that came out so you could not pull this up out of the ground easily. And um, George and I started to tackle this job early one morning before the sun got to this area. And uh, with our frustration and the uh, rising heat, uh, we called it quits for the day. And eventually, uh, uh, with the help of a uh, conservator with equipment, we were able to lift it out of the ground and reset. So it sits there in the apprentice lot um, in all its glory, uh, signifying Mercy Scully, the daughter of Liberty. Peter Warren is our next uh, noteworthy person who's buried in the cemetery. Um, he, uh, he had quite a life and um, um, a few things are known about it, but uh, with many of the people that are in the cemetery today, we are left with more questions than we have answers. But. Um, <coughs> Peter Hunt, or Peter Warren was an alias because his original name was Caesar Hunt. And um, he was a mulatto slave uh, that um, was attached to the Lovell family of Medway. And in um, 1769, uh, he purchased his freedom. Um, remarkable to uh, understand how um, in today's dollars of over 2,000, he would have the wherewithal and means to raise that money to buy his freedom. But he did. Um, and uh, he was involved in the uh, Revolutionary War in 1780, um, fought uh, at or near West Point, and when he was discharged, uh, the story says that it took him 10 days to travel 200 miles from West Point. Um, he's buried in the cemetery next to Sally Ephraim, who died in 1808. There's much mystery as to his uh, burial location um, because uh, there is no connection either to Sally, who died uh, six years before him, or to the lot that he is in. But um, the lot uh, deals with the Hamilton family that um, uh, was buried here in the late 1800s. So the, the question is, um, was he buried on the perimeter of the cemetery simply because of his race at that point in time? Um, Medfield was um, indeed a very white community. Um, and uh, if you take a look at where his grave is today, at that point in time, he would have been on the perimeter. But he, um, uh, he has a lot of questions associated with him. Uh, it was our, our dear friend, Mr. Tilden, who uh, postured um, in 1901 when that uh, book was written about Mitchell's 250th anniversary as to whether um, uh, Caesar Hunt had chosen the name uh, Peter Warren in honor of Admiral Peter Warren of uh, Ireland, who um, was uh, a very adventurous, a well-known and famous uh, admiral during um, the, the mid part of the 1700s. And um, uh, Tilden goes as far as saying that uh, uh, Caesar Hunt was indeed the illegitimate son of Peter Warren. Um, very difficult to um, make any of those connections because uh, the dalliance of a, an admiral would never be anything that would be published and you would never know for sure. Um, uh, he returned here to Medfield. Very little is known of him. He apparently lived in a house that no one understands at the corner of North and Main Street, where the, <coughs> excuse me, the Monk's block is today. Um, 
Uh, other questions there? Why is he buried where he is with the um, Hamilton family, um, part of that lot? Um, we don't know much about what he did when he was here, although his will is extant today in um, a probate court, at least for an interesting reading, but nothing um, comes through um, loud and clear about him. Uh, the other question is, um, both for him and Sally, who was it that funded these gravestones? Um, uh, they're nicely carved um, slate gravestones. And uh, fittingly for uh, Peter Warren, given his um, reverence in the community, um, <coughs> the inscription on his gravestone says, a respectable man of color. <laughs> The Reverend Daniel Clark Sanders is a um, very notable person who's uh, there to hear. Um, uh, his house uh, that he lives in still stands on uh, Main Street, headed east uh, on the right hand side, that large uh, Victorian um, grayish house that's there, was um, the house that he lived in. Um, uh, one of the things that's uh, notable about him is that uh, he was trained here in Medfield uh, in the ministry and went off to become uh, the first president of the University of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And um, while he was there, <coughs> unfortunately, the uh, War of 1812 broke out and the government commandeered uh, the university uh, for its um, uh, army and its defense, and so uh, the university was closed. Uh, he did just about everything he, that was to be done at the university at that time. He was the president, he was a teacher. Um, I'm not sure if he um, uh, swept the halls, but uh, he, uh, he was a man of many talents. And so he returned at that point in time to Medfield and um, became a minister of uh, the First Church here. Um, in 1815, uh, he served the church until 1829, and he continued living here in Medfield until he was, um, he died in 1850. Um, uh, one of the uh, most uh, peculiar aspects uh, that is interesting about uh, Brother Sanders is that in 1817, as part of a sermon, imagine that, um, he wrote or delivered uh, one of the uh, first histories of Medfield. Um, uh, we don't anticipate that to happen when we go to worship today, mm -hmm. is that the preacher launches into history. Um, but uh, he did, the, the sermon is in print today. It's a, a very interesting sermon because one of the things that Sanders goes about doing without the um, use of an Excel spreadsheet, is that he um, uh, postures as to how many people by 1816 are buried in unmarked graves in the cemetery. I'm not sure, I have an idea of how he went about doing it, um, but um, I've only done the A's and B's of the alphabet, <coughs> we need to amass a number, but, um, if you can imagine, he says in 1816 that there are n over 1,900 people buried in the cemetery in unmarked graves. So it can very easily be done. I've done an uh, analysis on um, uh, the number of people who died in Medfield from 1651 to 1699. And during that time period, 254 people died in town. How many graves are there today of those 254 people who died in Medfield? Five. So the argument is well set by Sanders as to uh, the number of people buried in Hillmark graves. Um, <clears throat> there's about 44 veterans of the Civil War buried in the old section of the cemetery. One of them is James Parkman Chenery, 
um, who was a young boy. Um, he was born in Medfield. Um, uh, his mother died when he was one year old. Um, but the, his service came from Clinton, Massachusetts. Uh, he moved away from here. <coughs> Excuse me. And he served in the uh, 15th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, he was taken prisoner and confined in Libby Prison in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, he was returned to service and um, then he was um, <coughs> killed in the uh, second day of battle, or third day of battle, July 3rd at Gettysburg. Um, <coughs> he, um, he had a, um, an interesting family life in the sense that his brother Franklin Artemis was killed 11 months later at Cold Harbor, but um, adjacent to this memorial for James Parkman is um, a memorial for uh, John Brown Chenery, his first cousin, who was killed at Gettysburg on the same day as James Parkman. Um, one of the reasons that uh, his story is presented today was the fact that um, we do have a, a photograph of him as a soldier in the Civil War. And those are few and far between, and they're just very nice to have. Uh, Deacon Samuel Smith um, was born here in Medfield in 1674, and um, he has some notoriety when it comes to uh, the day that um, Uh, the day that King Philip's war uh, descended on Medfield. Um, uh, he and his mother, uh, Elizabeth Turner Smith, um, were en route from their home uh, to one of the um, uh, garrisons up here at the, where the town hall was. And uh, as they exited their house and turned up the trail, well, it's, uh, in 1676, you can understand it to be a trail, um, but they came out of um, their home on South Street, and uh, legend has it they were right about at the uh, spot where um, Pound Street and South Street intersect. When uh, his mother was tomahawked to death by the Indians, and he was 20 months old, he was in his arm, her arms. He fell to the ground, um, whether unconscious or not, and um, uh, stayed with her. And it was uh, uh, later on that day when um, his family found him uh, near his mother. So um, it's one of the remarkable things about Samuel Smith is that he did survive. Um, <laughs> the day that the war uh, came to Medfield. Um, he lived a, a long and prosperous life and uh, was, was a selectman here in town. Uh, he, he attended the general court on behalf of the town uh, and he was a, um, a very active um, minister. I mean, um, excuse me, minister, uh, attendant in his church. <coughs> um, a slight digression, we just uh, <coughs> introduce you to the, the conditions that the cemetery had fallen into after decades of neglect. And on the right hand side, the left hand side, excuse me, you see the um, uh, stone for uh, Samuel Smith, his, uh, his mother uh, sits, uh, uh, excuse me, his wife sits to his right. Um, and um, it had fallen there and broken off and lay there for years and covered over with turf, um, laid in the ground. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the things that happens with uh, people who are connected uh, to the cemetery and to their family history is that um, uh, Carol McLennan, who you see here in the foreground, is 10th great-granddaughter. Elizabeth Holliston, um, 
had um, followed his wife and uh, discovered that, uh, what had happened to his gravestone. And he said uh, it was through um, Carolyn Walters' uh, beneficence that uh, that gravestone was repaired and um, put back in place. And there, um, Samuel Smith and uh, Elizabeth um, stand in honor and um, are recognized for their contribution. We'll, uh, we'll come back uh, later uh, in a tangent to uh, him and when we talk about another person. talk about it right now. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Smith Nino um, was uh, born here in Medfield to um, uh, Samuel Smith. Uh, she ends up being, um, I believe, a uh, fourth great granddaughter of his. Um, and uh, she has a um, uh, a story about her. Uh, she's buried over in the cemetery next to her mother. Um, and if, if you learn a new name uh, that you don't see in, in uh, use today much at all, it belongs to Waitstill Richard Smith, who died in 1860 in Louisville. But um, we're going to talk uh, more about um, Sarah. One of the interesting aspects of her life is that, according to um, the stories that had been written of her, um, uh, during the first few years of her life, she was of feeble frame and considered by her mother's friends to be not worth raising. <laughs> um, I would like to visit with her mother's friends and see um, what those observations were all about. And I mean, at that point, then what's the choice? Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Um, but um, Sarah spent her. Um, early life um, weaving uh, straw, and she was involved in, in straw factories, uh, both uh, in Midfield and in Walton. Um, uh, we don't know too much about the kinds of things that people did when they were in these factories, but one of the things that happened to her was apparently against <coughs> excuse me, one of the machines, uh, she raked open her finger to the bone one day, and so she lost about four months of uh, activity. And, um, she found that uh, the making uh, of uh, straw to be uh, seasonal, uh, did not provide much income, um, and um, but she did it. And uh, she also became a, a very good teacher in her lifetime, and um, she ended up um, through family connections, uh, spending a lot of time in Louisville, where she eventually uh, met and married her husband, Edgar. And um, um, lived a, um, a very productive life, given the introduction that she had <laughs> in the community. Um, and she, um, she eventually, uh, when ill health, um, started to take its toll, she returned to Hartford, where her daughter was living, and um, she died in Hartford and was buried in Medfield. But um, I quote from uh, just a, a few sentences from a part of her story when this happens to um, kind of announce um, the finality of things. It says, many pleasant and joyful events were scattered through her life to vary the serious and sorrowful ones which had been principally noted. She preserved the cheerful disposition which was nature's gift and met the hardships of life with all the force that was at her command. 
She conscientiously discharged every duty and endeavored to make her daily conduct conform to the teachings of the Bible. At her death, she looked with confidence to a home of permanence and purity, reserved for those who had been faithful and for whom there was no reward provided on earth. The inscription on her gravestone reads, I shall see the king in his beauty. Now this is her daughter, Mary Needham, and um, I introduced this uh, uh, image of her only to um, add a note that um, uh, there was incredible intelligence within that family. For in 1852, uh, Mary Needham married the Reverend James Bartlett Gregg. <coughs> so there is a family connection uh, to this, and it was from um, uh, that connection that there are an incredible number of relatives today um, who uh, look favorably and honorably at Glen Lake Cemetery for their early relatives who are buried here. And, um, they need uh, support and funding for preservation. The Reverend John Wilson, uh, Medfield's first minister, the number of firsts in regard to uh, John Wilson. Um, he was the first minister in town. Uh, his father was the first minister in Boston. And um, the story has it that uh, our John Wilson was the first to ever offer prayer at a funeral, and this was, excuse me, for the Reverend William Adams of Roxbury in 1665. Um, uh, he came to Medfield in 1651 uh, and served us three different ways. He was a minister, a physician, and a schoolmaster. Um, You don't get this in the cemetery. So. <laughs> um, the image there of um, John Wilson's gravestone is one that was taken in 1901 uh, for the history of Medfield. And this is the condition we found it in just a few years ago. It had uh, tipped and sunken into the ground. And so one of the tasks that uh, we do with the trust in terms of preservation is to um, repair it. And so we have um, the stone now sitting um, above ground. Um, now the thing that's interesting about this, and as you begin to wander the, the paths that show gravestones at the cemetery, is that uh, keep in mind that John Wilson died in uh, 1691. Uh, this is not a gravestone from the year 1691. This is a slate stone uh, with uh, Grecian urn of the classical Greek theme of the early 1800s. And so it was in 1818 that uh, this great stone was erected uh, for John Wilson because um, Silas Clinton, who, who was um, getting on in years, um, figured that he was the last one in Medfield who knew exactly where John Wilson was carried. And so he uh, funded this particular uh, memorial. We move now to um, John Jesse Francis uh, from uh, the introduction today. He is one of the four famous artists that uh, lived here in Medfield and um, is one of the two that are buried here. Um, he was born in Boston uh, to John and Mary Wall Francis, and um, 
uh, painting uh, was his particular uh, forte in life. And uh, when he came to Medfield, this was the site of his studio. Um, and so this is a very old picture of that um, site. You recognize it today as the Peak House. Um, looks a lot different. It, it, over the years, it has changed dramatically. Um, and uh, um, it's just got vines growing on the roof and vines growing across the top and you know, half a tree out in front of it. And, um, but this is a photo of the Picasso taken about 1890. And it would be during the time that uh, oh, John Chester oh, Francis was painting there. There's a chair in front, and I swear that's one of his paintings leaning up against a leg that's for sale. Um, but very difficult to take that out. This is an image of what his uh, studio looked like on the second floor of the Peak House, uh, looking west. Um, uh, supposedly, uh, he came out here during the summers to paint. Um, uh, you notice in the far left corner of the room there are snowshoes. Um, I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, but in the uh, front right corner there is a um, uh, stove that provided by the heat. Um, uh, there are what appears to be geraniums growing in the window. And um, if, um, if I knew enough uh, with all the knickknacks that are on the shelf and around there, you can begin to get a much uh, clearer idea of uh, the kind of life that he created for himself. Um, we don't see her, but that, that's one of his um, paintings on the bottom left corner leaning up against. The snowshoes are still there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the picture used to be, but for some reason it isn't anymore. It'd be nice to get it back there. All right. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. No, she's still there. Second floor next to the east window. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's right, it is the east window. And the grating in the floor by the stove is yeah. still there, too. So the heat could come up from below. Yep. Uh, we know that uh, John Cherchy Francis was painting here in uh, 1886, um, based on this little. Um, sketch that he did of the peak. And um, that obviously was what that place looked like when he was living here. Um, you can see uh, his flowering penmanship. And believe me, his ability to paint was just <coughs> as peak. And so um, uh, his paintings are uh, much in demand. Um, and it was a number of years ago that um, the trust uh, had an exhibit at the Dwight Derby House of 23 of his paintings. Um, uh, you should um, be alerted that um, sometime within 2015, there will be another exhibit um, at the Zool Gallery of the four masters of Medfield. Um, there will be Francis, Monks, Innes, and Bunker. Um, and so we hope on, on a three-day adventure to introduce you to those particular paintings. Well, one of the uh, wonderful aspects of um, doing work at the cemetery and reaching out to families is that, <laughs> excuse me, at the time of his, uh, a few years ago when we had the exhibit, um, his grandson on the right, David, came. Um, and uh, this is David's daughter, uh, Julie, and her cousin, uh, Danny. Um, the Francis family knew nothing about his presence in Medfield, the fact that he was buried here. He had a studio here. Um, and so they were overjoyed uh, to come and participate. And they brought uh, uh, some of their own paintings that were part of the exhibit. And, <coughs> Uh, Julie said she will come back again. Her, her father is now 86 years old. She felt the trip probably you know, more than he could take, but uh, they'll, they'll come back. But um, uh, through research, um, we found, uh, because there was, his burial was not in the records, uh, for, but from his vital record of 
death in Newton, um, uh, we found the fact that he was buried here. His first wife and two of the children are buried here. Uh, they died in Boston. They were disinterred from uh, cemeteries in there and brought out here. Um, uh, he is buried here. And his second wife, who died only in 1955, is buried here. Um, so there's a good collection of uh, Francis here. So we, uh, we're very honored that um, the family uh, uh, participates uh, with us in the celebration of him. Moving on. Uh, we go to Hannah Ellis Rockland. Not much is known about her, but uh, <coughs> um, I wanted her to get some honor today because she needs to be honored. Um, she is the first female born in Medfield in 1651. Um, she married Samuel Rockland. Um, and she died in 1717, having outlived seven of her eight children. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, things happen to gravestones and cemeteries. And um, back in uh, 1899, when the catalog of inscriptions was written for the cemetery, um, this is all there was <coughs> even back then. And, um, so today, uh, we, uh, we poked around into the ground around to see if we could find shards that belong to it, um, but we can't. And so um, this is what we're left with to honor Anna Ellis Lockwood, the first white person born in Midfield. Well, so the Green family is uh, a family of some uh, import uh, here in Medfield. Um, some things are known about them, but uh, not much. Um, uh, they're buried over the cemetery. And here you see um, the gravestone for uh, Samuel and Rachel. Samuel's the father, uh, Rachel's the wife. Um, and when we discovered it a number of years ago, as you see it here, it was laying on its back. And um, the turf had been peeled away from it. You see the, the, how it was framed. And so for a long time, that was the, the only part of the um, memorial that was seen, was laying on its back. But what we did when we lifted it up, we found that the front of it had been um, buried for years. And it was in a little better condition because the elements were not affected it, and so uh, this is his, uh, her son Robert, who uh, died in uh, 1851, and the daughter uh, Catherine, um, who was the last to die in 1884. Uh, they lived on Prairie Street. Um, they had uh, great, um, uh, he did, uh, Sammy Green, a fantastic reputation as an incredibly hard worker. He would work on details to gather hay in that field. And apparently, um, not everyone in the, in the work crew was as so industrious as he would. And the other people would try and cut corners about their jobs in the cemetery. And his job was sort of police that group. And, um, so he would work far um, in greater capacity than <coughs> other people. Um, but um, the family uh, was industrious enough for them to be able to afford their own home, which is an African-American family in Medfield in um, the late 1800s. This was quite remarkable. Um, and um, uh, they lived there with a white woman uh, who died after they did. Um, and she's buried over in the lot with them. Um, but they uh, have a reputation and an honor of being a very industrious African-American family living here in Midfield in the late 1800s. Um, the one thing about uh, 
that particular memorial is that um, we intend to include it uh, when we do uh, the fourth grade treasure hunts uh, from Dale Street School. And so here, here you see a class, uh, a group of uh, students and their parents around it um, in the fall. Uh, so we want to uh, recognize the Greens primarily because of history and the children need to understand that um, um, African Americans lived here in town and that we honor them and they have a very dignified uh, uh, memorial. We return now to the second of the four artists of Medfield that are buried here, John Austin Sands Monks, uh, who um, lived here um, in about the time that uh, John Jesse Francis was here, um, and about the time that Dennis Miller Bunker was painting here for a couple of summers. Um, and uh, <coughs> Monks is known as the painter par excellence of sheep in America. And he was um, an incredible sketcher and uh, one of the, the defining aspects of him is that he would um, go and live um, in farms that had sheep, and he would um, uh, live in the stables with them to get to know them and their, um, their ways, and so he was able to paint um, uh, pictures uh, or sketches of Sheep. We did a few um, farm animals, um, but it was predominantly sheep that uh, his notoriety is from. Um, but he also painted dogs, and uh, you may recognize Jack as he uh, uh, is on the image here, and today as he is on the um, utility box out in front of the center. Does anybody want to identify what kind of dog he is? Austin, Austin Terrier? Mm -hmm. You got part of it. Yeah. American Staffordshire Terrier. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so he painted it. And the, the, the original image of this is hanging today in the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. um, this was Monk's a studio, uh, as it was uh, mm -hmm. seen during. Um, Medfield's 1901 parade. Uh, the studio today sits where the Middlesex Saving Street sits in Main Street. Um, and that was here. It was. And you all recognize today the Monk's Block on the corner north of Main. Elegant old photograph of it. Um, would it look like this again? We would probably um, feel good. <laughs> um, but um, here you see um, uh, businesses. Uh, if you look at the windows on the first floor that face this way, uh, those are still there today with the same framework. Um, and the Keogh uh, building uh, to its right is still there. The horses, the tree, and um, the watering well disappeared. Um, but uh, this was um, a monk's block, uh, as it was known. And a few years ago, when we did a famous and noteworthy walking tour of the cemetery, uh, we had the honor of having Monk's granddaughter, an artist herself, Dear Hutchinson, come and make a presentation about um, her grandfather. And um, uh, there lives today in uh, Santa Fe. Um, was enamored to see uh, the monk's block when she came. It was her first trip to Medford ever, a few years ago. <clears throat> so she honors his, uh, his tradition by uh, painting today. Um, uh, we return to a famous person of the Civil War, Alan Alonso Kingsbury, um, the hero of Medfield. Um, he was the first person in Medfield to enlist in the war for three years. He was not the first person to enlist. There were other 
he had four buddies that enlisted for three months uh, prior to him, and um, I'll refer to them in a moment. But um, it, it was uh, just terrific to have this sketch of him uh, because um, this was taken at a, you can clearly identify the time of his life when this was taken. Because when he went into the war, um, uh, he was in the infantry and he was wounded. And um, uh, he recuperated back here in Medfield. And when he was fit to return, he went back. And what happened when uh, servicemen return after being wounded, uh, they become buglers. And so we know that um, this was uh, at that point in his life, um, sometime in 1861, 1862, when uh, he returned to service. Uh, this is a uh, photograph of his memorial at the cemetery, one of the most elegant and extensive ones there in terms of carving. Um, uh, since this photo has been taken, it's been cleaned. Um, uh, he was the first to be buried here, but uh, as you well can imagine, uh, this was not there at the time of his burial. He was the first person in Medfield to be killed in the Civil War at um, Yorktown, Virginia. And there was, an, an, at that point in time, an incredible community response to him because he went into a war with uh, three other um, of his friends uh, who lived in Chelsea. And uh, they were all um, uh, killed in the battle. They were all brought back to Boston. Um, and it was not until their arrival back in Boston after being uh, killed in battle that they were uh, for the first time embalmed. And um, there was elaborate um, uh, funeral service for them in Boston that was attended by an incredible number of people. And then um, uh, it was Alan's turn to uh, return to Medfield. And so he, he came back here um, in a horse-drawn wagon, and when that um, entourage um, hit the road, hit um, the town boundary at Westwood, it was met with the Medfield Brass Band, and they escorted uh, that um, uh, wagon down to his family's home, which still stands today on South Street. If you go down South Street, way down South Street, and there's a right that goes up uh, Noon Hill Road, and they live in the next house, um, a gray, a bluish house that sits there. There's a, a sign on the front that says it was the home of uh, John Kingsbury. So uh, this, he lay in state there uh, for a day, and um, then the entourage with the band uh, came back, <coughs> brought him up to um, uh, first church, uh, for which there was an elaborate uh, funeral, and um, uh, there were so many people that went to it. Uh, the story says that uh, uh, the overflow sat in the lawn outside the church um, during the time of service, and then it was time to uh, bury him at the cemetery, and um, uh, he was carried on a pall by four pallbearers who happened to be his friends who had enlisted prior to him. So that was an honor that the family um, gave them. Uh, he's buried here in the cemetery um, with his father who died a few years after him and then his mother and his brother. Um, uh, we are um, we're fascinated by uh, the memorial itself, um, and we'll um, we'll go into greater detail about this uh, art at uh, our presentation in two weeks, um, because there is uh, so much art on his memorial that, um, as the next uh, the next presenter will say, that when they went to um, place in Taunton that makes these memorials. 
uh, the family said, give me one of everything you've got. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but their, the imagery here is just fantastic. And uh, supposedly, um, uh, as romance has it, um, the saying on, in the cartouche is what he said to his mother mm -hmm. as he left Midfield uh, to go off to war. I'm fascinated by this memorial. I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out who funded it. Because um, these were family, Kingsburgers were farmers in Mexico. And um, this, uh, this is a lot of bales of hay uh, <laughs> to do this. And when was it installed? Um, we have no idea. Um, on the right side, on the left side of uh, the base is uh, his father's name and death years. But his mother and the brother never made it on to it. They're buried in the grave. So he's buried off to the side of this. But Alan Alonso Kingsbury um, uh, has a lot of family, descendants here in town today. Um, another Civil War uh, veteran is Julius Augustus Fitz, um, who was born in Millis um, in 1843. And uh, entered the um, Civil War. Um, and there's quite a story that he wrote about his um, his arrival in it. And so I read his words from this particular diary. The talk in the store was that was also the post office. This was in Mills, as well as the conversation on the streets was on one topic: war. I was wild to enlist, but father and mother were set against it. When the second call came in the spring of 1862 for men to serve for nine months, I could no longer bear restraint. How well I remember one Sunday in Millis. We had four services in those days, morning service, Sunday school, an intermission for lunch, then another preaching service, and another in the evening. On this occasion, I was eating my noon lunch of crackers and cheese when a half dozen other lads said, Boys, let's enlist. And each in turn responded, I will if you will. <laughs> I hurried home that Sunday, planning a convincing speech for my parents' ears that would win their consent. Seated at the dining table, I could not eat any dinner and finally burst out, Father, may I enlist? Father said soberly, you are not strong enough. I could not let it rest there and said, Calvin, his brother, is in college, and the others are too young. There is only myself. Couldn't you let me go? Father could no longer refuse, but said that his consent was still unwilling, and mother could not hold out alone. I did not wit any longer as I wanted no dinner. Father allowed me to take the horse and I made the rounds of my boyfriends and the results that we enlisted. And after a physical examination, all were accepted except for me. Um, I was heartbroken and when Captain Stedman who had been my schoolmaster, noted my grief. He said to the recruiting officer, this boy deserves to go on, and I will be responsible for him. I am here to witness that he faithfully kept his promise. So Julius Augustus Fitz uh, entered the Civil War and served in the area around uh, New Orleans. Um, and then returned to Medfield, uh, where he was the entrepreneur for the old country store, uh, which uh, sits today where Starbucks sits. Mm -hmm. You recognize the town hall? Mm -hmm. um, and um, my reaction when I see this is I, I wish I'd been a salesman of bunting. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made a million. Uh, but uh, that's how folks did it then. You, you see very little bunting around today. But this was in 1901 at the time of Mitchell's 250th anniversary. 
Um, you see three bicycles in front of the store. You see uh, some uh, young men leaning up against the fence. Uh, but um, uh, Julius Augustus Fitz ran this particular store as part of his home. Um, and this is what the interior of his store looked like. And there he is. Um, it's just fascinating to find, uh, figure out what's for sale. And obviously, some prices are just screaming at you, and then there are other things in there, but um, this is where the people in Methville went to buy uh, dry goods and uh, groceries, and um, he had just a uh, sterling reputation as a um, entrepreneur. Uh, there were two aspects of that particular business that were the firsts in Medfield. He was the first to sell gasoline when um, automobiles came into existence. And before that, <coughs> he was the first uh, to offer a delivery service. <laughs> a wagon and a horse that would uh, take the things from other people. Um, here's a, a photograph of Julius uh, late in life um, uh, with his um, rifle. And his uniform, he was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, post-117 here in Medfield, uh, very active <coughs> in it. And um, at the time he died in um, 1944 at the age 100, he was the oldest veteran of the Civil War um, that Massachusetts had ever known. And uh, he's buried over here at the cemetery. And, um, Interesting to know today that uh, his great granddaughter still is living today up in Holton, Maine, the elderly lady, but um, she's keen about um, uh, her involvement in the history of Medfield. Uh, Marinda Melissa Keniston is another noteworthy person who has remained below the radar, so to speak, for. Um, many particular years until the um, last few years. Um, we're looking at order based on one of her um, um, relatives who made the uh, inquiry into um, the burial place here. Uh, Marinda was born in Lennoxville, Quebec, Canada in 1848. One of six children that was born to Francis and uh, either Harmony or Cynthia Babbitt was her mother's <coughs> and her mother died when she was um, three years old and um, her father at that point in time felt that uh, it was very difficult uh, for him to raise all the children so um, Marinda, Samuel and Cynthia were all placed in the Shaker community in Enfield, New Hampshire and that is where um, uh, they lived. Uh, at least Marinda stayed there for 59 years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a photograph of the great stone building at Enfield, one of the largest buildings that ever constructed in America. I suppose before skyscrapers. But um, by the time she was 18, she had become a, an associate elders. Um, her daily tasks included um, being a tailor, uh, a housekeeper, and working in the dairy. Um, by 1900, she had arisen in stature to the top leadership position as a deaconess. Um, uh, she was a woman of her time. And if you can imagine um, living in the sheltered life of a, a Shaker community in the back hills of New Hampshire. Um, uh, she wrote this in 1890 when she was just 52 years old. But this is an example of her progressive thinking. Why should not housekeeping and homemaking be considered occupations for women and of no less account than stock raising or farming are to men? Mm -hmm. 
Why should not the home duties usually assigned to women tend just as really toward the important duty of earning an honest livelihood as those do assigned to men? Why should a woman who faithfully devotes herself for the comfort and well-being of the home feel that she is in any degree dependent on another for support? <laughs> Are not her brothers equally as dependent on her as she is on them? When there is a proper when there is proper growth and better understanding of the ways throughout so-called Christendom, mm -hmm. will there not be more enlightenment on the proper duties of both men and women? Fascinating mm -hmm. to, to understand uh, what she was thinking uh, at that point in time. But she's buried over here in Medfield, and so the the real mystery is how she ever ended up here. Yeah. Yeah. She lived in. Um, uh, Enfield, and she was involved in the Shaker community, um, which was pretty kept. Um, the, uh, the fact is, her brother Samuel lived here in Enfield, and um, uh, he had ended up here as a farmer uh, at some point after he left that community. Uh, they lived on Frary Street at the corner of Frary and Cottage. So if you're looking at um, Basil's restaurant, face on, look to the left, that's the house that they lived in. And so Samuel and all his family are buried here in um, Plain Lake Cemetery. And uh, even though Marinda died, is another example of things getting out of control. She died in 1911, not 1910. But um, this is the memorial for the Keniston family about in um, uh, ground zero for the old section of the cemetery, which is quite um, remarkable, uh, because uh, when folks started being buried here in 1905, this was an area of the cemetery that was available. And according to uh, one of Marinda's uh, closer relatives today, the family accepted the fact that when they bought this lot for burials, they realized that other people were buried below it. So, oh. so the, uh, here again, we have a uh, great argument as to the number of unburied uh, Mark graves. Richard Crowdenshield Derby is another um, well-known Metfield name who um, uh, was born here in town in 1834. And um, a dapper young man, uh, we see him here in his um, Civil War uniform and uh, in his civilian attire. Um, but uh, he went off uh, and fought in the Civil War and uh, was killed at Antietam. And um, he, uh, he's buried here. His mother at the time that he died was living in Auburndale. And uh, through the efforts of um, Richard's second cousin, um, Richard's body was um, brought back from Maryland uh, for a funeral in uh, Auburndale. And then um, after the funeral was uh, completed, if you can imagine, it was in 1862, another horse-drawn entourage traveled from Auburndale to Medfield. How long did that take? Um, so he is, uh, he's buried here. There's quite an elaborate um, uh, ceremony for him at the cemetery after the funeral service in the United Church, uh, excuse me, the First Church. Yeah. Um, one of the requests of the family, interestingly enough, was that um, uh, they may have been present, but the honor guard did not fire the muskets because the family felt it was too close to the emotional um, ending of his life and they did not want that repeated. Um, and so he, uh, they may have been there as an honor guard. But so, um, one of the most fitting aspects of uh, that particular funeral, which is um, uh, well written up, uh, in books today is that a, a, a certain point in time, 
during that service, a um, young girl with her brother came forward and laid a bouquet of flowers on the grave. And no one was able to identify who that girl was, but um, suspicion is that it may have been a girl that um, was romantically uh, connected to Richard at that point in time. And, uh, so a few years ago, when we did a, a walking tour of the, uh, the Civil War, veterans buried in the cemetery, um, uh, trying to capitalize on the drama and the poignancy of that particular expression. Um, uh, when I was telling the story, um, I asked and invited them to the high school class with a bouquet of flowers to come forward and to lay in the grave. Simply for us today to be able to recognize what may have happened at the 1860. John Henry Richardson, another Civil War veteran, born 1828 in Brattleboro, Vermont, died 1902 in Brattleboro, Vermont, but um, went off um, uh, during the war to become an assistant surgeon. I'm not sure how you can become assistant <laughs> are the surgeons. Um, and uh, uh, he served as unit. Most, most of the unit uh, activity was down in um, Port Royal and uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And you can imagine um, what his life was like. And um, he returned at the end of the war uh, here in Medfield uh, to become the um, doctor uh, in this town for uh, just over 36 years. Um, he and his wife uh, were an impeccable um, team of uh, health care workers. Um, she would provide uh, health care service that um, uh, he was unable to do based on uh, his requirements with the uh, dealing with the sick. Um, they lived on North Street in a house that still stands today. If, if you were at the, um, when you're back to the fire station and you look across the street, and there's that elegant old yellow and white mm -hmm. house with a in front of it. That was the, uh, the house that John Henry Richardson lived in. Uh, he is buried here in Medfield. Um, and um, the, uh, he outlived. Um, four of his children. Uh, the fifth one uh, died after he um, died, and they're uh, all buried over here at the cemetery in an elaborate granite memorial. Uh, the bookends to our presentation, our presentation this afternoon are the Tildens. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very appropriate that uh, Paul of Babcock Tilden uh, becomes mentioned because um, uh, she and her husband in this community, if they had been living today, uh, were hand in glove. Uh, um, they did just about everything together. And she was quite a uh, historian, um, and she was an author of poems. And she, uh, one of the um, uh, best known items that she's written is uh, quite a um, Quite a biography of Hannah Adams. Um, and uh, they lived over here on um, Spring Street. If you're at, uh, you're going south on Spring, Spring Street and uh, Cumberland Farms is on your right, they live in the second house down on the right. There's a sign on the front that says, This is where children used to live. But um, our, um, our ultimate slide is just an incredible expression of the two of them <laughs> together. <laughs> now, same studio, same table, same books, same rugs, same rock. I mean, uh, like, uh, like peas in a pod. Um, that's a, a much earlier picture of uh, her. Um, 
Uh, that goes back in time. I recall, uh, you can tell me uh, more correctly, she is carrying a muff. Muff, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so we got an idea that maybe this uh, photograph was taken in the winter. Um, also, he's probably inside the chamber of the studio here. In the but um, incredible couple. Um, uh, he died six months after she did. Mm. Very close. Mm. 1912. Um, no children. Uh, they have a, a very simple uh, memorial over at the cemetery. Mm. You may have questions, questions <laughs> comments, <laughs> or um, what else? George. James Chainery, you caught my attention when you said he died at Liberty Prison in, in Richmond. He was, no, he, he was a prisoner there and was exchanged. So he, he was, he had been caught in some battle, become a prisoner. Liberty Prison because of the connection to other midfield veterans. I thought as William Bonow died in Libby Prison yes. in one of the in the hospital, but he didn't get shipped back to Medford. No. Okay. All right, thank you. No. Yes. There, there was on two graves, and I can't remember the names of the people, but it looked like angel wings and then a skull in the middle. Mm -hmm. What is that all about? Uh, that is art. Um, um, and that is a, a good segue into presentation two weeks from today. But I will answer your question today. Okay. <laughs> because I don't want to read the um, But uh, those particular forms of um, art were used by early gravestone carvers to express a fair amount of symbolism. And that's what art is. And um, Medfield uh, has an extensive collection of carvers who, who come and, and um, carve a variety of art forms over there. But um, basically, when um, the skull uh, is exhibited with wings, that means that the spirit is. Um, ascending to heaven from this particular person. And so it's incredible. Um, uh, Laurel, who will come on April 25th, is one of the Greystone scholars who has visited Midfield three times and written extensively on uh, Greystone art. And um, uh, she is able to enunciate um, Clearly, a whole variety of stories relative to that kind of imagery. Um, and at one point in time, I thought I still might do a, a presentation on all the different uh, art forms that are in the cemetery relative to early. Please do. Yeah. Yes. This is the next one. All right. I wish that they were on TV or something. They are. Yeah? yeah. Oh, good. That's what the gentleman in the corner is doing. <laughs> oh, fabulous. <laughs> yeah, the idea is to put, put these on as YouTube. Okay, I'll so, try and find them. So we'll let you know where you look. Okay. Um, but, Great. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. That's it. The lady who was in Louisville. Yes. Was she there during the Civil War? And what was, does anyone know what she and her husband's stance was during the Civil War? Uh, yes, she was there during the war. Do I know the stance? I'd have to read more closely in her uh, papers. Mm -hmm. um, th th these were stories written about her. She didn't spend much time writing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if her husband was from there, you know, was he a Confederate? Or Kentucky was greatly split. Yeah. They made both of them union. And she came on with that one. So what happened to him? Oh. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no uh, he, I think he died after she did. He's buried down in the book. Um, I think she, based on health, she may have come back to be with her daughter in Hartford. 
Um, but um, that's a very good question as to the, their um, allegiances. Yes? You mentioned uh, ministers and deacons on several occasions. Were they all members of the one church, a congregational church? Early on, they were all part of the First Parish Church. And it wasn't until, um, uh, let's see, Thomas Prentice was the fourth minister in Mansfield. Sanders was the fifth. They were all working out of the uh, First Parish at that point in time. Um, I have to go back. Which is what today? Pardon? Which is what today? The Unitarian Church. Unitarian, Unitarian OK. Um, I have to go back to my history of the second congregational church in town is the when it started. 1828. All right. Thank you, George. Um, the thing that, that I noticed about um, <laughs> ministers buried at the cemetery, the, the three out of the first four ministers in that field were buried. The third of them was run out of town. <laughs> and they were like, and so he, uh, he, uh, whether he ended up in Dedham or not, I'm not sure. But um, the fact is that ministers back then stayed for a long time. And so they, were, they would die here. But to find from 1828 on ministers who were buried in the cemetery, we have um, Mrs. Gayer, who was the wife of Baptist minister who died while he was here. She is buried in the cemetery. But uh, other ministers um, just um, would move on to other communities as they do. Where were the ministers regularly educated? Uh, early on, they were Harvard. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any other. Brown. Around. By the 1830s, 40s, 30s, somewhere. I don't know about Medfield, but mm -hmm. Brown was a new action. Mm. Great. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Production support provided by Medfield.tv. Access to our community.